keep the rapport throughout the life cycle of the uh, engagement. So rapport being like trust and respect. And out of the three of those, trust is the most important. So it goes trust, respect, like, that is in the order of importance. People go, yeah, but people got to like you, man, in order to buy from you. And I go, no, they, you prefer that. But all of us, I think at one time or another have purchased somebody from, purchased something from somebody we go, you really like that person. You're listening to the Sales Today podcast, and I'm your host, Fred Copestake. On this podcast, we explore how sales professionals can develop a modern approach to winning business, the application of virtual selling techniques, how to create meaningful business relationships, and much more. Why not take our free collaborative selling scorecard to see how your sales approach suits today's environment? You'll find a link in the show notes. And welcome to this episode of the Sales Today podcast, where I'm delighted to be joined by Doug C. Brown. Doug is the CEO of CEO Sales Strategies. There we go. Doug, I got the tongue twister right to start with, so we're, we're looking good for the rest of the episode. <laughs> I always tell people drop the CEO side because I always mess it up too. I was like, CEO, assistant, why, why? <laughs> you didn't tell me to do that before, so thank you. <laughs> Anything to be read. Uh, uh, well, I can see we're going to have fun already. Um, so CEO sales, <laughs> there, I got it right once. Now I'm pushing my luck. CEO sales strategies, what do you guys get involved with? Well, we, we essentially teach people how to think, act, and, and be a 1% sales earner in, in their geographic region or their uh, industry um, as they deem a, a 1% earner to be. Okay, cool. So get people top of the top. That's what we're, uh, that's all. Top of the top. How do you think that way, act that way? And if you want, how do you be that way, right? How do you be? Uh, a 1% earner. Not everybody wants to be, you know, some people are very happy being at the 3%, the 5%, and that's fine too. Whatever, whatever uh, they build their life around, right? So we start with what do they want in their life, including the company owners. And, you know, how do, how do we bring everybody to think and act that way? Because uh, it elevates not only their, their income, but it also elevates the experience that people have with them. There's a level of, uh, you know, I think if you, even if you didn't want to stay at the Ritz Carlton, if you walk in, they're going to, you know, do things differently than say a two-star hotel, so to speak. Yeah. No, like that. No, and interesting, isn't it? That not everyone wants to be, and, and probably with quite legit reasons, and even still top five to 10%, you're going to be doing pretty well. You know, yeah. You're still pretty special. So. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in, in the, the reality, what I've found doing this over, you know, the last 25 years is most people don't want to be in the top 1%. They like the idea of the money. They like the idea of possibilities, but you know, it requires, um, some, some inner work and some outer work as well, you know? And so not everybody wants to be there. What I have found is most human beings on this planet, they want to have a little bit more than they need every single month or every single, you know, anim. And they want to be able to go and say, geez, you know what? The, the new show of Hamilton came in. And, you know, the tickets are 2000 pounds and you know what? I can spend it and not worry about it. That's really what they're looking for. Yeah. And then, no, it's interesting that you're sorting that out first and then just checking. That's what you really want. Okay. Well, this is going to be the work that we're going to do. But, uh, I, I'm convinced a lot of people like the idea of something rather than actually doing it. Definitely. Well, you know, there was a time where I tried to date four or five women at the same time. And I thought it was a really smart idea, you know? And then I, I, I learned it's not <laughs> well, the hard way. Did you? <laughs> yeah. Well, I actually even went, I mean, this is going to sound very, uh, chauvinistic, but I actually even started trying to find women of the same name. So I wouldn't mess up the conversations. Right. <laughs> but, uh, it, it's not a smart idea. All you men who ever thought about that, it's really not right. So what I realized is what I want is that, that person in my life who I appreciate on a on a, a minute by minute, you know, daily basis where I look at her and I go, wow, I'm so, you know, blessed and happy to have that person. And, you know, all the other things that I thought I wanted in a person, you know, it's nice to have, but it's really, it's not necessary. And I find that with people's incomes as well. They're, they look at it and they go, wow, you know what? I wouldn't mind having an oligarch's, uh, you know, uh, you know, boat. 
But then when you have to maintain that boat and you realize what the annual cost of, of the staff and everything, it's like, no, I really don't want that. What I do want is this. And if I can get them to that, to be truthful about what that is, then we can build a plan around that and very easily achieve it. Excellent. Oh, cool. Well, today we, um, we, there's a whole lot of things we could talk about. We could carry on talking about this and we could sort of set up a different, different uh, podcast and maybe we should actually. Um, but one of the things that I thought was interesting that I know you talk about quite regularly are the five must have elements, five must have components to close sales faster. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's pretty good. People are going to want to close sales faster. They're going to want to close sales. <laughs> right. Um, so if we just, if we take people through five components, talk through those, kick them around a little bit, uh, I think this is going to be a valuable episode, whether you're 1%, 5, 10, even just get them a medium. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that will yeah. help you with that. Yeah. No, I, you know, I mean, it's a lot, many people want to work like we, we've done um, surveys over time and we find out the number one thing that all companies want, all people want is more new clients. That's, they, they always come back to, I want new clients. And usually the second one uh, in order of priority is I either want better marketing or I want to work more leveraged. So it depends on the size of the company. So if it's a larger company, they want better marketing. If it's a, a, a medium or smaller company, they want better leverage in their selling process. And so they want to shorten up that close time. That's one way of gaining leverage, right? So if we can do this in half the time, that means we can see, in theory, twice as many people. So that's where I started looking at, okay, you know, how many components really are there to, to making that shorter close time? And, you know, miraculously, you, you know, it kept coming down to five. Originally I had like 12 and then I'm like, oh, these three, you know, go into this one. And, and it came down to five, not that it's a power number, but it's, it is what I found it to be. Yeah. It's, it's good on podcasts for numbering them off on one hand. So we can remember that, that's where true. about we are. <laughs> It'll keep you and I on track for sure. <laughs> we, we will do. I mean, I, I'm scribbling all sorts of stuff down anyway, but, uh, let's. Well, let's have a think about these five. Yeah. Let's sort of think about them. How do people apply them? Um, how can we get some, some more sales closed? Stuff? Sure. So no, number one, make sure you're talking to an actual buyer. I, you know, I know this sounds, uh, or may appear to be like a, uh, duh, of course. Right. But there are so many people that try to sell to people who are not the actual buyer and they're wasting time, precious time in the process. And what I've discovered is all we have to do is discover who the, who the buyer is and only talk to that person. And, and people go, well, what about influencers? You, you talk to them, but you don't, you don't have a sales conversation with them. You don't have that full in-depth sales on process. So talking to the buyer, that's the person who says yes and can actually give you the check or give you the cash or, you know, whatever renominate renumination, remuneration. See, I messed that word up, Fred. <laughs> uh, that, that, you know, the exchange of value that's going to happen. It's the buyer that people want to talk to. And amazingly enough, a lot of people don't talk to buyers only. They, they, they're working their way through, you know, six people to try to get to the buyer. Let's go right to the buyer. Because the buyer is the one who's going to say yes, be able to appropriate the funds, be able to disperse the funds, and the other people can't. They have to talk to the buyer in order to do that. And so let me just check. When you're using the word buyer, are you using that as the kind of the general catch-all word to be that person, as you say, who's kind of got access to the funds, rather than somebody who has got buyer in their title or like kind of procurement or someone who's kind of in that? finance function, but you just kind of know it's that person. If they can put it on the credit card, they're the buyer. If they can pay out of pocket, they're the buyer. They're using it like that. Yeah, absolutely. It's the person who actually gives you, can give you the money. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about the one who maybe cuts the check, might go to a, you know, an accounting department and they, they send the check. That's not who you want to be talking with. You want to be talking with the person who says, I've done this, send the check, right? That's, that's the person to talk with. 
Because then you don't hear, oh, geez, uh, I got to talk to other people. Now, there could be buyers. There could be buyers. There could be multiple people who actually make that buying, uh, you know, in a consensus. So you want to be talking to the buyers in that, in that capacity. But don't waste our time in selling, not talking to that economic buyer. Because if we do, then we're going to, you know, just spend lots of time with people that certainly are nice people, but they're not going to allow us to shorten up that sales cycle. Yeah. The economic buy-in. Mm -hmm. Also good old proper, proper sales terminology in there. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Cause the danger is that we talk to all these people and they're making lots of nods and they're users and they thinking, this is awesome. What you're saying will help my life. No end. Yeah. Right. Loving what you're saying. And we feel all good and you know, uh, I know what pleased in ourselves and then it's all lovely, isn't it? But it's not the person who's going, yay or nay, we're doing it. We're going to move, we're going to move forward. Yeah. And, 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 you, and, you know, look, we're all going to make mistakes from time to time anyways, but if we talk to more buyers, <laughs> we'll make less mistakes in that first step. You know, I, I, I certainly have made that mistake, you know, where you think, you know, you get happy years as a, somebody selling and you're like, oh, this person's going, oh my gosh, this is, yeah, this is so great. So great. So great. Yeah. We're, we're going to do this. And then crickets. You know, and it's like, what happened? Well, they took it to the real buyer and the real buyer said no. And, you know, so sometimes, you know, you get ghosted that way. Sometimes, you know, it just drags on and it, it's like, you're just trying to figure out what went wrong with the date, so to speak, right? <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. Going, going back to my foolishness Good. earlier, right? So oh, I love the analogy. We could keep the analogy going all the way. Don't worry. <laughs> um, okay. Cool. So that's last number one, finding the, the buyer, the right person. Um, what's the second thing we need to be aware of? Uh, again, these all might sound basic, but keep the rapport throughout the life cycle of the uh, engagement. So rapport being like trust and respect. And out of the three of those, trust is the most important. So it goes trust, respect, like. That is in the order of importance. People go, yeah, but people got to like you, man, in order to buy from you. And I go, no, they, you prefer that. But all of us, I think at one time or another have purchased somebody from, purchased something from somebody we go, you really like that person, you know? Uh, maybe we went in and had a, a meal that was really good in the restaurant, a pub or whatever. Uh, you know, served uh, up a good meal and we just didn't like the person who brought the food to us. <laughs> they, they were rude or whatever. We still paid the bill, you know, we still paid for the meal. <clears throat> so we bought something. Um, sometimes we buy things from people we don't like because it's a scarcity thing. It's like, oh, well, this is the only, the only automobile available, right? <laughs> uh, that was the example I was thinking of. <laughs> oh, was it? Um, I bought a yeah. what I didn't like, but it's the car I really wanted. <laughs> yeah, I, I just purchased vehicles um, in the last couple of years, and I remember, you know, the the cavalier uh, attitude of the of the salesperson. It was like, yeah, well, look, we only have one of these on the lot. You want to wait seven months? Fine with me. I don't care. Someone else is coming in, right? <laughs> you know, no, we're not negotiating, right? That type of thing, right? So I didn't really care for the sales entity, but, you know, we ended up buying the vehicle anyway. We were leasing it, so we really didn't need to, 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 to have a real in-depth conversation on why I didn't like that person, but, uh, or care for, care for their attitude, I should say. So, but trust, if I was buying that same vehicle and I thought for a moment that it wasn't going to be safe. And I was going to say, pick Fred, you up at the airport and drive you back <laughs> and the, and the wheel was going to fall off, you know, <laughs> uh, heck no, it wouldn't work. Right. Just so trust is one of those things that we must keep throughout the life cycle of the relationship. Why the relationship? Because we're not looking just to sell one time. One of the ways of speed to close is you have a built-in relationship that the next time they have something that you can appropriately provide to them, they call you. And that is usually the quickest sale that ever happens. I mean, I've had people call me and go, hey, I need somebody to straighten out <laughs> my sales team. You know, it's, it's my brother's company. Uh, I'm calling you. 
right? And so, you know, you talk to the brother and he goes, yep, that's what's happening. And it's like, okay, here's the fee. And they go, okay, right? And it's like 25 minutes. You just close the six figure deal or whatever in, in you know, consulting. Um, and so <clears throat> that's why we keep the rapport throughout the relationship. The other reason to keep rapport throughout the relationship is you just have a better life. Yeah. <laughs> just a decent human. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Right. The, the, the goal of, of, of sales, the, the challenge with salespeople and, and, and a lot of them don't play win-win and, you know, rapport is about playing win-win. They win, you win. And I know this is a really basic concept, Fred, in life, but I mean, if we play win-win on every single level, we gain more. Maybe even if we don't get the sale, we gain more of something else. And when somebody trusts us, sometimes it's, uh, truly we can't fulfill that sale. Sometimes it's without uh, question out of the scope of we can help somebody. And if that's the case, we should be the first to disengage. Um, unfortunately, I see people stay in there too, too long and then they find out later, oh, no, I can't fulfill that, right? And that rapport is broken because it's taken it all the way down the, the line and the buyer's going, this isn't going to work. But, you know, so... The reality is we play win-win throughout and keep rapport throughout the lifetime of the relationship. That will shorten up uh, close time for sure. Yeah. Interesting on the win-win thing. Um, I don't know how often you've seen this. Now, it would normally make sense that we told salespeople about make sure the buyer gets the win, right? You know, don't be trying to ditch them up and sell them stuff they don't need or want and all that. Yes. But how often have you seen it when actually we also need to get sales teams to remember, you've got to have a win as well. Don't be trying to do something for them that actually doesn't make sense for you guys to do because that ain't sustainable either. And we need to just help them make sure they get that stuff right too. Without, without question, I agree 100%. Don't discount. Yeah. <laughs> Don't discount. Like there's, there's very rare instances where people must discount. Now, you know, there are legitimate reasons for discounting, but the, the reality is when we discount, let's say we discount 20% and our commissions are discounted in addition to that, that's not really a win for us unless we view it as, okay, I, that's acceptable to me. So it goes back to, you know, what do you really want, right? So, but remember when we discount, we might have to sell five or six things to make up for that 20% discount because Every time we sell something, there's time, energy, money that goes into it. And, and a lot of times people who are selling don't look at it in that capacity. They go, oh, I got the sale. It was 20% down. I get the next sale. But if you didn't discount, then you would have to make less sales in order to make the money. So yeah. whatever that number is for, for that individual. But we, we do have to win-win. You know? and, and you know, some people will not uh, play the win on their own side because they you know, the childhood wounds and they're bringing them forth. Right. And they feel like, well, you know what? I got the sale, but I wasn't, you know, uh, I didn't deserve more than that, that type of thing. Um, and what I have found is if we do play win-win and we hold to the line of what we want, we can gracefully and respectfully be the first to disengage and everybody feels really good about it. Yeah. And there, there's a really good feeling that we have um, when we can do that. And one of the ways that people don't have to not play win-win is by being a master prospector. Mm -hmm. so, so having way more coming into the funnel than we actually need, because then we could be far more discerning on what we say yes or no to. Yeah. Oh, love it. We could talk about this particular one for the next couple of hours quite happily because yeah, sure. we could go into trust and how do we build trust because you build it not do it etc cetera, etc cetera. i'm aware though we need a number four <laughs> no, sorry three i can't even count <laughs> but don't tell me number five is do your maths <laughs> oh we need to make sure we get through all the uh, the other elements so uh, what else what else do we need to to, to do what's, what's in our five well i mean the third one I mean, just one thing about trust just tell the truth Right. Always just tell the truth, not honesty, honesty, subjective. Truth is objective. Just tell the truth. And uh, the third one is, you know, make sure you have an established problem 
or an opportunity that you can truly resolve. <laughs> we kind of touched on it before, but if you can't resolve it, it's time to disengage. And, and so how does that actually speed up? Well, when we know we can resolve it, then we can go in and create things, which I call, you know, I don't know states, right? So a lot of times when we're selling to someone, someone is viewing us from a, a particular frame. They come from a frame. Many times, if we think about it, if it's a B2B situation, which I know a lot of your listeners are, that buyer on the other end, it's not just about money. It's about a couple of ROIs, the business ROI and their personal ROI. And that buyer on the other end might have an ROI, which is I'm not going to look foolish by making a mistake. Because if they look foolish and they're in a position where they possibly could be compromised and get fired, that decision could actually mean the difference between their career or not their career. So when we're looking at, is there an established problem and opportunity, I would challenge everyone to ask two thoughts. What is the business return on investment? And what is the personal return on investment that this person is actually seeking of who I'm talking to? And can I fulfill both of those? Because if there's not an established problem or opportunity within the company or within the individual who's making that decision, the sale is unlikely to happen. I know all of us at one time who have ever sold, they were just like, oh my gosh, this is the perfect business fit and they still don't move forward. It's because we missed the personal ROI. We, yeah, and the personal one is more than likely emotional, isn't it? I mean, um, we talk about, you know, buying's emotional and the rest of it. And we a spreadsheet, which is a particularly emotional piece of kit, is it? Yeah, we do all this stuff and it's there. And it's like, well, why is it making sense? Why? Because the spreadsheet was so damn good. We forgot to go, what was it personal about? <laughs> yeah. They're worried about this decision. It's the biggest one they're ever going to make. Yeah. Looking foolish at the risk. They need to feel safe. That's the stuff, isn't it? More it it absolutely that, is. I, I can illustrate this, Fred, through, uh, I owned a telecommunications auditing and consulting company where we used to go in and we'd audit phone bills and we, you know, rip down their bills basically. Right. <laughs> and we would average 24 and a half percent savings on every client across the board average without having them even change their carrier. We just go to the same carrier. We could renegotiate their bills and we, we never asked for money up front. We just wanted a percentage of savings. So it's like, all right, well, you know, you're spending 10,000 pounds a month or dollars a month, and now you spend 74, right? So you save 2,600. Wow, that's a great deal. And you don't pay anything for it. You just pay out of the percentage of savings. I could not get that to close more than one in five. And I was like, what the heck is wrong with me? Like, I mean, that's 30,000 pounds, right? You could take that money and reinvest it, for, you know, back into something else. And it just made no sense. But from a business ROI, it makes total sense. So I went back to all my buyers and I went back to the people who said no to me and I asked them this simple question. Why'd you buy from me or why didn't you buy from me? You don't worry about hurting my feelings. If, you know, if you, if you don't like a guy, you know, who, Barely has hair on his head. I understand that. Right? Yeah, that's, that's, that's why he's all my sales. <laughs> We're in the same club, I guess. Um, and you know, if, if you don't, if you wanted somebody taller, you wanted to buy from you know a, a female versus a male, whatever. Tell me the truth, right? And here's what they told me across the board: We wanted to buy from you. We didn't buy from you because we thought that if you did what you did and you knocked us out of service because making changes to a phone service can result in disruption of the phone service. We thought if we would, you would knock us out of service that the people who own this company would fire us. So I was dealing with director of telecom, vice president of telecom, right? And so I went back and I changed my messaging. And I said, and I did do this. I created a system that assured 
99.7% of the time, we would never knock them out of service. We had a guarantee on this and we had a, uh, I think it was 14 point checklist that we went through. And so I walked into the next buyers and I said, Hey, you know, how would you, without knocking out your carriers or having any disruption in your service whatsoever, 99.7% guaranteed. We have a 14 point list that we go through. I'll go through it with you. How would you like to reduce your phone bill by almost 25% or more and reallocate those funds? My close rate went from 20% to 71%. And they said yes on the first appointments. Yeah. So that's how Im important it is to understand the ROI from business and personal and to make sure there's an established problem or opportunity in both sides of those um, you know, concepts because that will enhance your sales process, but it also speed up your close. Yeah. And, 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 that, and that throws up some really interesting uh, quandary sometimes, doesn't it? Where it's like, well, yeah, I can save you so much money. Right. Yeah, but what you're proposing looks like real hassle. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you're going to use up a lot of my time and the politic games so I'm going to have to play in the company to push us over the line. Nah, you're all right. <laughs> but, yeah. but if you don't know that you can't do anything about it and you just keep pushing that one that one um, right right because we're pushing we're pushing one line of information and we're not, not aware you know i um <laughs> my wife's going to kill me when i say this but you know sometimes when i speak with her she's like you're not hearing me right and i'll be like yeah you said this and she said no you're not hearing me and i say well what do you mean she goes you're thinking like a man and i'm like uh, okay, honey, how am I supposed to think, right? <laughs> because I, I am a man, right? I'm, isn't that what I'm supposed to think? Like she goes, not when it comes to this subject. And that's a good illustration of what the personal ROI is she's seeking. Now she tells me and I go, oh, geez, that's easy to deliver. But if you, if you don't cue it. <laughs> I, no, I'm smiling because I've been accused of that. Funnily enough, in the path, I, I, my way of overcoming it was just to repeat back the words that were said. That, that doesn't work either. No, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. No, no. We are parking the back. No, nope, you weren't listening to what I said. Yes, the words were this. Yeah, yeah. It's not what she wanted to hear at that moment. And so when we ask, what are we supposed to be asking or how are we supposed to be asking? And this, this is where I think people selling uh, either on a personal level, like we're just talking about, Fred, or... Yeah or on a professional level in a business setting, they're not willing to ask the question. And if we just ask the question of, you know, how would you like to be communicated with, right? Those type of things, it is important to this other person. Because remember, we, folks, we're not selling to titles. We're not selling to CEOs. We're not selling to CFOs, you know, or directors or whatever title you want to put on there. We're selling to human beings who all have wants, needs, fears, desires, values, frames, right? We want to understand what those are. And that's where we can connect on a human to human level. And that's another way, Fred, of building trust yeah. in, a, in a big way. <clears throat> because once somebody feels that they can trust you more than they can even trust themselves because they trust you that much, i.e. our best friends, right? You know, I mean... My buddy Mike called me up in the middle of the night at 4 a.m. And he's like, hey, I, you know, I went out on a bender or something, you know, which he doesn't do because he's older. But if he did, uh, you know, back in our younger days, I'd be like, where are you? He'd be like, uh, by the, the fence post of, uh, you know, this store. I'm like, dude, that's two hours away. I'll be I'll be there. You know what I mean? And I would just get up and go. So if we can get our clients to view us in that regard, to trust us enough to call us or to trust us enough to make that decision because we they know we have their back. We have their front, we have their sides. That's when they you'll know that you're playing win-win. Oh, yeah. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Right, we, we better continue. We better continue. We're at four, I believe, number four. Number four. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just because they have a problem or an opportunity, we must get the buyer commitment to resolve that problem or opportunity. So what I mean by that is, 
there are a lot of problems that exist within wherever you're going to be selling to. Sometimes they're not committed to actually resolve that problem. Or there's opportunities there and they will push that one up. And th the opportunities one was really tough for me, Fred, because I I'm kind of that guy who goes in and optimizes things and looks at things and go and creates new opportunities. <clears throat> and, you know, I've created new opportunities where people pocket millions of dollars and they push it off. And it's like, it drives me personally a little, you know, nutty because it's like, it's millions of dollars. And they're like, yeah, but we're not committed in that direction right now. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things that if they don't have the commitment and it's very simple to figure that out, you ask, you know, is this commitment uh, able to be met within this time frame? And <clears throat> if they say yes, and you keep digging a bit, you'll, you'll discover whether or not they're, they're committed to it. Um, cause it's, there's no fun being in a place of, you know, being accountable without authority. Right. And so it's one of those things that if the buyer is not committed, even though it's a great idea, then that sale will be lengthened or won't happen at all. Yeah. And, and of course, well, all these are connected anyway, <laughs> but this yeah. is connected back, isn't it? It's talking to the buyer because you're talking to Correct. somebody and they've got this issue and this is a problem. It sits in their court, needs to do something about it. But the buyer person, one, two, whatever levels up has got different stuff they're bothered about. And though this might seem massive in the little world we're talking in at the time, actually in the grand scheme of things, and that don't matter. We're looking at doing something else anyway, which tries right. up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Spot on the head on the nail. So to, you know, as it said, right. I mean. And that's why we want to be talking to the buyer, because if we're talking to people who are not that buyer, then it will seem like everything's going fine down the line. Um, I, and, and I've made this mistake. I, I was speaking when I was in the telecom industry, uh, I was speaking with the vice president of telecommunications. Um, and I thought everything was great. And everything was going along. They were giving me all the buying cues. And, you know, I was working with these people and I was doing little tiny jobs for them. And, and I wanted the whole account. And uh, one day, uh, so I was, I was working with the director at that time. And then, and then I got to know the vice president. As I got to know the vice president one day, I, 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 uh, I discovered this massive hole that they had where I could save this company literally millions and millions of dollars annually. And they, they weren't moving forward. So I talked to the, the vice president who I realized was the person who could actually sign off on this. And he told me, he said, Doug, there's no way this is ever going to happen. And I'm like, we're talking like $10 million a year in savings for this company. And he goes, yes, but if that happens, I'm going to lose half my staff and I have to work harder. Yeah. Right. So what did that tell me? I was talking to the wrong guy. He wasn't the buyer. <laughs> Here's the person who could sign off. I should have been talking to the CEO or the C uh, or the chief financial officer or somebody who had that buying power to say, we're doing this. Right. So the reality is, you know, we all make mistakes. So people, you know, don't beat yourself up for it because you know, the, the old analogy uh, in baseball or as an American uh, sport, you know, so to speak, uh, you're not going to knock every pitch, you know, out of the park. It's not going to yeah. happen, right? I don't know if they say the same thing in like cricket or whatever, but. Um, yeah, sim similar. I mean, we, we use a lot of uh, American uh, analogy to it all, Jenny, but yeah, it is, it's kind of, it's a couple of that. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that makes sense. What's that fifth one? What is our fifth element? So it's a kind of a combination, but we, we want to create agreement, what I call yes states, yes state agreements. So this is getting that economic buyer in the sales speak term to actually come into agreement more often. In other words, we create states where it's like, we will, we will, we will fashion questions to come into agreement. We will also use, as I alluded before, with what I call I don't know. So what is an I don't know? 
It's when you ask the tough question that gets the buyer to go, huh, I didn't know that. You know, and then you follow up with a yes state uh, agreement question, which gets them to go, yeah, that makes sense. Right. So what we're doing now, this might sound a bit manipulative. It's not if you're doing it in a win-win fashion. Sometimes we have to ask the hard questions to get people to come off of their fear point and move them to neutral. <laughs> but most people selling don't dare ask those questions, Fred. And so what ends up happening is the sales cycle gets elongated. The sales process is elongated. <laughs> and so if we're asking a question that, you know, um, like I remember I was talking to somebody who said, we're doing great. We're doing excellent. You know, we, we just renegotiated our agreement. We saved 20%. My question was, how did you know that's not supposed to be 37%? Hmm. Uh, what do you mean? Right? Well, did you know X, Y, Z could happen within your agreement? Uh, no, I didn't know that. Well, it, it's, it's article 14 in your agreement. Cause I knew that agreement very well. Right. Says you have a 30 day process in which you can, you know, shop out and renegotiate. No one reads agreements, Fred, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and, 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 you know, they, they don't read them. So if we're an expert, which is another way of building respect and trust, then we could point those out. Geez, I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, did you know that based on this ruling that you could, you could invoke this? I didn't know that. Would you like to have a reduction above and beyond what you're doing? Yes, I would. There's the yes state. Get it? Um, and, you know, well, in addition to that, would you like to improve not only this, but be able to get new technology in? What do you mean? Right. I didn't know, you know, so there we go. And we keep toggling back between those, those tech. Yeah. You can use the latest and greatest thing. And here's how you can actually put a full new technology system in and have it paid for by the carrier. Did you know that? No, I, my gosh, is that something you would be, you know, thinking would be beneficial for your company? It would be absolutely beneficial for the company. Why? Well, then we could do X, Y, Z. Why are you not doing that today? I don't know <laughs> because it's due to the technology and you just keep toggling back and forth. What that does is the human brain, if we say yes, 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 it's really hard to say no, <laughs> but we're not doing it as in a manipulation. What we're doing it is for the win-win relationship of the buyer, because sometimes buyers, they're as afraid as anyone else, because if they make a mistake, that personal ROI or even the business ROI could come back to haunt them, especially if they're a public company. How many public companies do we see make, uh, you know, crazy mistakes uh, that they didn't even think were a mistake. And now they got a backpedal. I mean, you know, Budweiser beer is going through that in the United States right now. Right. I've read about that. Yeah. <laughs> it's in, to me, it's crazy. I don't even know what this is all about, but I mean, the reality is, you know, uh, Coca-Cola did the same thing when they brought out the new Coke. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was like well, the, the people in the United States are, are, are plotting a revolution against Coca-Cola for bringing out a new beverage. Like, I don't even understand the Budweiser beer thing, but the, re the reality is that one still hasn't died down. You know, now Budweiser came out with uh, a Harley Davidson logo on their cans and people are still upset about everything that's going on. Right. So now I would not want to be the executive who made that, you know, that that decision. But the reality is someone's going to take the fall somehow because the company will survive. So, you know, the, you can go back through historically through decisions that have been made that just don't go well. And um, the reality is sometimes that happens, right? But how do you play win-win in those situations? That's another thing you've got to ask yourself. Because remember, that relationship doesn't go away. It'll move to a new place. Yeah, no, I, I think... It, you could use it for manipulation, but then you could any sales tactic if you yeah. want to go down that route. Um, it's the intent, isn't it? And if you're doing this with the right intent to help someone think, and you're introducing a way of creating attention, and that you need that tension for your brain to start to make sense of stuff. Well, that's the neuroscience, isn't it? Yeah. By asking that to then give them a, a compare and a contrast with the right intent. And actually, if you've got a good relationship, if the trust is 
built or it's quite strong, it's easier to do that. It's absolutely yeah. the right thing to do, isn't it? Yeah. 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 It, it, and it's not an analogy just for selling. It's an analogy for life, right? So, I mean, if we play that way with our friends and our spouse who better be our friend, um, you know, and our, our children, right? Um, it's, a, it's a great way to parent because you get the children to come to the decision of what's right for them, but they're not feeling like you down on them, so to speak. Yeah. What child, no child wants to hear that. Right. Yeah. So it's kind of like, and no buyer wants to hear that either. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. um, and so what we do is we, we create this state where we get into an agreement together that they have a part in coming to that. Yes. Love it. Love it. I love all five. I love all five of those elements that they, they all make sense. Um, we, we could have, we could have chatted about each of them. <laughs> for, for a long time. Um, and I'll probably will pick up on a couple of them at, at, at a future date, if you fancy that. But um, I do. Where can people get in touch with you if they want to sort of find out more straight away from the stuff that you've been talking about? How can we get in touch? Yeah, I mean, they can reach out to me uh, on LinkedIn at Doug Brown 123 uh, They can send me an email directly at Doug at CEO sales strategies.com. Um, Fred, I never asked you this, but I, I don't even know if I told you this. I wrote a book just recently. Um, that's, that's actually just getting on the final touches. It's a, it's an ebook. I'm going to put it out as an ebook. We're going to sell it, but I, it's on how to be a nonstop 1% earner, the psychology and philosophy behind it. Um, and, uh, if you are okay with it, uh, I'd be happy to give your audience a, a free copy of it. Uh, if, if that's all right with you, that would be awesome. <laughs> ah, number six, number six. value. <laughs> 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 value yeah. um, no, say what we'll do is we'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile in the yep. show notes. And if you give me a link to that, we will pop that in as well. So yeah, can I, can I give you a, an just email? Push out, push out. Yeah. Can, can yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> well, we, we don't have, we should have it up on a page, uh, this week. I, I this literally is still being, uh, uh, completed. But if they send an email to you matter, Y O U M A T T E R, because yeah. well, to us, you do matter. Um, yes. you, you matter at CEO sales strategies.com. Yeah. And, uh, they, uh, they put your name in the, in the headline and they say, you know, you know, Fred and give me my book, uh, something like that. <laughs> we'll be happy to send it out to them. Where's my book? <laughs> yeah, where's my book? It works for me. <laughs> but yeah, it's on my computer. I need it up very nicely so you're not going to get it. <laughs> um, no, we can certainly do that. And I'll, I'll, I'll look forward to having a look at that as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. With, without question, it comes to you. Ah, oh, superb, superb. Thank you so much for coming along, sharing some new thoughts, um, some good little stories in there, some nice little things that might get us in trouble, but hey. Hey, I, no. I'm sure we could survive that. We have done in the past. So, uh, a absolutely. But, well, talk to my wife. I'm always in trouble there anyways, because <laughs> same, um, but, uh, thank you so much, Doug. Really do appreciate it. Thank you, Fred. I really appreciate it. And very grateful you had me here. Yes. yes. Thank you for listening to the sale today podcast with me, your host, Fred Copestake. I hope you've enjoyed what you heard today. If you did, please get in touch and hit subscribe. And remember, you can take the Collaborative Selling Scorecard for free to check out how your sales approach works in today's environment. You'll find it in the show notes. <laughs>